you just keep coming to church just as you are, but the promise is you're not going to stay the way you are because the same God that delivered me is the same God that will deliver you. The same God that transformed me is going to transform you. The same God that changed me is going to change you. The same God that healed me is going to heal you. Today, I want to talk a little bit about search and rescue. So I'm going to go ahead and get my little search and rescue jacket on and get ready to do a little bit of search and rescue in front of you and uh, got my good gloves on here and these, these do fit and um, got my rope on. That was a joke. Anyways, um, they gave me this equipment because I'm supposed to be supposed to be searching for someone that's lost here. Search and rescue. Hello. Search and rescue. Ain't nobody here can. So this, and I started by, I don't know why they had me. I came by Starbucks. I had my McDonald's this morning. It's just a, well, what a waste looking for people. It's supposed to be lost over here. Hello. Anybody here? Search and rescue. Search and rescue. Search and rescue. Anybody here? Search and rescue. Search and rescue. Hi, I'm from Search and Rescue. Anybody here? Search and Rescue. Anybody here? Search and Rescue. Search and Rescue. Well, I tried, you know. I don't know what's wrong with these. They told me somebody's. I'm going to take a little bit of a lunch break over here. I'm tired now. Nobody around. 10-4. Have me a little break now. This stuff's very tiring, you know. Hmm. Boy. Oh, wonderful. They gave me a bone broth. I think I'd get this in the health center. Good bone broth bar. Chocolate bar. Mmm. This search and rescue stuff's hard. Tiring. I didn't find nobody there. Okay. So that's one type of search and rescue person, okay? So let me talk about the good kind of search and rescue person, because that's a bad kind of search and rescue person. No one wants to be like that. Okay, I'm here from search and rescue. Search and rescue. Anybody here from search and rescue? Search and rescue. Search and rescue. Oh. oh, oh. Are you okay, sir? No. No. No, help me. How can I help you? I need to be resuscitated. You need to be resuscitated. Yes. Well, I'm not going to resuscitate <laughs> you, but I'll help you out. Oh, have a seat here, sir. Oh, man. Hang on. Look like you need some water. Heartburn. Hang on. Don't drink it, because I drank some already. <laughs> I found you! I found you! What's your name? Izu. Izu, like, like a car? <laughs> I found Izuzu! I found Izuzu! Thank you. Thanks. You can have that. If you have your Bibles, iPhones, iPads. I'm going to ask you to turn to Luke 15. Luke 15. According to the FBI, there are 661,593 people that have gone missing. One of my favorite scriptures is found in Luke 19 and verse number 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. I don't know about you. I want to have the same mission as Jesus. I'm a Christ follower. And if his mission upon this planet was to seek and to save that which is lost, I also, in my jobs, in my neighborhoods, and wherever God leads me with strangers, I want to have the mindset like a search and rescue. Notice this. You can never rescue anything that you're not searching for. Notice the order. Search and rescue. Well, I don't know why I don't rescue anyone. Probably because you're like the lazy guy showed you today, 
who's trying to trip over them. He's trying to do it within his, his convenience and it's not his comfortability. It doesn't often happen that way. Again, Luke says that Jesus came to seek and save that which is lost. You're never going to find the lost if you're not seeking for them. There has to be a diligent seek within our lives. And so I want to use this very, very famous trilogy to share with us what it looks like to be part of a search and rescue team. And as we navigate through our lives, our vocations, our careers, and in our homes, our neighborhoods and families, our gymnasiums, our Starbucks, or wherever we do life, we need to be thinking along these lines about searching and rescuing for those that are lost. We can't be individuals because the opposite of that would be abandoning and ignoring and forgetting and avoiding and overlooking and evading and not paying attention and being too busy and too distracted that we are not about our Father's business seeking and saving that which is lost or searching and rescuing. So in Luke 15, the trilogy is this. It talks about the lost sheep that needs to be sought after. He talks about the lost coin that needs to be sought after. And he talks about the lost son that needs to be sought after. I'm going to only read the first two stories to you today. And then we're going to talk a little bit about four characteristics. In Luke 15, in verse number one, and then all the tax collectors and, underline this word, sinners drew near to him who's the hymn of this verse let's say it this way then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to you what would you do with them and they came to hear him and the pharisees and the scribes complained saying this man jesus receives sinners and he eats with them and he spoke this parable to them now, I'm going to read this from a message version, and it goes like this. By this time, a lot of men and women of doubtful reputation hmm, were hanging around Jesus, listening intently. The Pharisees and the religious scholars were not pleased. Not at all pleased, they growled. They, they, they growled, he takes in sinners and eats meals with them, treating them like old friends. Their grumbling triggered this story. He goes on and he says this, what man of you having 100 sheep and he loses just one of them? does not leave, leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one, go after the one which is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors saying to them, rejoice for me for I have found my sheep which was lost. And I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over sinners who repent than 99 just persons who need no repentance. So here we have the lost sheep. Now we go into a second story. He says, or one woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one little coin, does not light, it with, light the house with a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, I have found the peace which was lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is more joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. We're just going to look at a few verses now of the lost story of the son. Because each one of them is a progression of value. One is one of, not, one of a hundred sheep retaining a value. Then we get into a lesser quantity, one of ten worth more than the sheep. Then we get into another story, one of two sons, which is the highest value. So when you read the trilogy, I want you to see what are the things 
that are in common here. Why did Jesus tell three stories? Very rarely would he emphasize three stories for a truth unless it's important for you and I to understand what is he saying? Because he's saying probably the first time you're not going to get it. And probably the second time you're not going to get it. So I want to drill this into you how I care about the lost. Remember how I started this story. I used to hang around sinners. People that had reputations and the religious people, the people that have been saved a long time, going to church, shouting hallelujah, didn't like it. It made them upset, disturbed them. So I had to tell three stories to break down some things that were hindrances within their lives. Hey, everyone. We want to get to know you just a little bit more. So if you have any question or simply want to reach out to us and let us know how you feel, then please message us. Or you can visit our Facebook page and leave a comment or even share a video if you like. Whatever way that you want to share your life, we're all the way down. But just make sure you do one simple thing for us. Come as you are. So he goes into the story of the son and the son is probably the one that's preached about the most. Father has two sons, divides up as well. One son, the older one stays home with his father, takes care of his father's household goods, the the, the property, and the other one goes into the far country, spends all his money, living like an unsaved person, living like he's, uh, 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 you know, a, a prodigal. Uh, he's spending all his money in Vegas. He's doing everything that is known to be done as a sinner. But then he comes to himself. There's a level of repentance. He says, I want to come back to my father, and I want to be restored. And the Bible says this, Verse 22, but the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it. And let us eat and be merry for my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and it is found. And they began to make merry. Another rejoicing that took place. Notice on these three things. Let me just draw out a few things. Notice these three things. He didn't get the sheep when he found it and say, you bad, no good sheep. Doggone, you stupid idiot. He didn't get the coin and rebuke it. He didn't get the son and say, I told you, I told you, if you, if you, if you live wrong, you're going to get beat up and sin, and you're going to go to hell, and uh, you know, you're not going to be restored. And uh, uh, he, There's no judgment. There's no wrath. There's no anger coming out of him there's absolute love there's absolute compassion i'm so happy we have to begin to look at what he was trying to teach us and so there's just a few four points i want to give you today as we talk about search and rescue so here's how the order is going to go number one is this we have to have a desire to search and rescue because matthew uh, excuse me, Luke 15, I love this thing. All the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him. This, this challenges me. It's probably for the last two or three years, this verse has been in me. Now, that's the way you need to read your Bible. You don't just need to read, try to get as many verses in and then move on and move on and move on. And that, that's okay, some sporadic reading, but sometimes you just need to park it and try to chew it and chew, you know, like a good bone? Just chew it over and over and over and over. So about three years, this has been in me, and I've been saying to myself, why was sinners so attracted to Jesus? What made Jesus so attracted? Because sinners are not attracted to me. How many sinners come up to you? Oh, come on, be honest with me. Be honest with me. How many sinners come up to you and say, can I hang around you and I'd love to listen to you? Where are you going to be at 5 o'clock because I'd like to follow you there? Where are you going to be tomorrow because I'd like to hang around you? Come on, be honest with me. How many sinners love to hang around you? What made Jesus so special? Did he party with them, break over a 44, have a joint with them? Bring out the ladies, the senoritas, and get... Well, ma- no, we know he didn't do that. But why did sinners want to hang around him? Because sinners don't want to hang around me. And sinners don't want to hang around you. So I just recognize, if you and I are going to be great search and rescues, there has to be a desire within us. We just got to want it. We got to want it beyond I have to. 
We've got to have a desire to want to do that. And I think sinners love to hang around Jesus because he was kind to them. He was really concerned about them. I think he listened to them. I think he was really interested in them. I think that's what made him attractive. And you know, that's going to make us 2,000 years ago really attracted to sinners. They're going to be attracted to us because they really want people to care. Do you really care about me? Are you really concerned about me? Will you sit down and will you listen to me? Will, do you respect me? And a lot of these, are, are you concerned about me? And I think that's what made Jesus really, really attractive to them. That no matter who you were, whether you were a sinner or a saved, whether you didn't believe in him or you believed in him, whether you considered yourself a follower or a non-follower, he loved everybody equally. I don't do that. I love people, some people more than I love other people. I can see I'm the only one in this church. I'm more comfortable with some people than I am other people. I'm more happy to see others than I am some. I'm more animated with some than I am with others. You get the best Diego with some and you don't get anything with others. But Jesus was equal across the board. It didn't matter and that made him very attractive to people. You want to be attractive? Go to, don't go get some Botox. Just, just care a little more. Be concerned a little more. Be kinder a little more. Listen to people. Respect people. I don't care what they did. I don't care who they are. Show a level of respect, kindness, concern, and listen. So let me give you a list of things that you can learn how to be more, more attractive to sinners. Number one is this, be comfortable, but not complaining. If you notice the Pharisees, they began to complain about Jesus hanging around them. And there's too many of us that don't feel comfortable. So because we don't feel comfortable, we complain. We complain about their lifestyle. We complain. And we got to be at the point where we are comfortable by not complaining. Number two, be non-judgmental, but hold to scriptures. Be not condemning, be not condemning toward them, but you don't have to condone what they're doing. Be not like them, but like them. I wish I could name all kinds of lifestyles before you today, and I wish I could name all kinds of sins before you today, because I don't want to highlight one greater than another. But I think you know where I'm going and what I'd be talking about. And it's amazing how many of us, based upon our beliefs, our experiences, will associate one sin above another sin. Like, I don't have a problem hanging around people that are alcoholics, or people that are drug addicts, or people that are this or people are that, but I can't stand those kinds of people. They're nasty. Really? One sin is the same as another sin, and let him that is without sin cast the first stone. So you ain't ever been nasty yourself? Hey, I want to personally invite you to our church. There are a lot of great churches, and I want you to experience any Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church. I think our church is the greatest. If you're ever in the area, I want to personally invite you to our church. We welcome anybody and everybody. If you're tall or if you're short or you got a great education or you don't have an education, it doesn't matter your skin color. It doesn't matter the diversity of your life. It doesn't matter if you like Starbucks or you hate Starbucks. I want to personally invite you. If you come, come and say hello. Let us know that you watch us on Real, and I appreciate you sharing this television program with a lot of people. God bless. Whatever God's into, I want to be into. Whatever He likes, I want to like. So this story ends because the older brother doesn't like what the father likes. 
And you see this attitude within him of arrogance, pride, and haughtiness. That son of yours returns home and you throw him a party? You never throw me a party. It's not right. I've never done wrong. You never invited me to a party nor cut a fatted calf nor given me a robe, new sandals, and a ring. And now this son of yours who Lord knows has done whatever he's done in the world, returns, and there's this celebration going on because he doesn't have. Please, son, come into the house. Come to the party and rejoice with us. I ain't coming to that party. So I don't know about you. I don't want to have the older brother syndrome when it comes to lost people. And it's so easy for us. The longer you are saved, there's a sense of, more self-righteousness that can come upon you. And, you. and the longer you get saved, you forget the sinner that you used to be. And you're more quicker to judge than to be compassionate, humble, and merciful. I don't want to be like that. And so the older brother, let me give you these three things that I see within the older brother. The first one is this. The older brother is this. He wants his daddy to himself. He don't want to share his daddy. And when you don't win souls, you don't want to share your daddy with nobody. He my daddy. That's my blessing. I ain't, I, nobody else going to get blessing. This is my inheritance. I don't want no one else to have an inheritance. And when we don't soul win, we don't want to share our daddy with nobody. That's what I see in the older brother. The second thing is this. He doesn't want his dad to make him uncomfortable. Uncomfortable is come into the house and rejoice with me that your brother who is lost and is found. And the older brother's syndrome is I don't want to be uncomfortable. So those kinds of people like that make me uncomfortable. Their lifestyle, how they talk, how they live, what they do makes me really uncomfortable. So I don't want nothing to do with them. And so that's the older brother syndrome. I don't know about you. Make me uncomfortable. Make me uncomfortable. And I wish I could be totally transparent by calling out different sins, but I wouldn't do that because sin is sin. But there, there are things that you and I know that get under our skin, that irritate us, that make us feel really uncomfortable. We see them on television and we mock them. We judge them. We, we, we do things like that. And so I'm asking God, make me uncomfortable. Make, what is that within me? Where did that get? And last of all, the older brother keeps scores of people's deeds. You seem to know what people do, don't you? I always have to ask you, how did the older brother know everything? Did he have a spy out there taking notes? Your younger brother, look at him over there with this hoochie mama all night long. Got pictures of him and the night hours and everything. And then that servant come and report back to the other brother. That older brother syndrome keeps records and scores of what people do. And says, you know what? That's between the father and the son. That's not me. Get me out of it. That person, how they live is between them and the Father. And the Father forgives them and loves them, and they repent. They repent. They repent. Because that's what that younger son had to do. He had to acknowledge what he was doing was wrong. Then the Father says, I'll forgive you. But So it's, don't believe that God will just forgive if you don't repent. Don't take the scripture out of context. He repented. He returned back home. I want to talk to you just a little bit about are you hurting? Are you broken? Are you lost? Are, are, you, are you happy? You know, these are strong words. You know what? I want to ignore them. I don't want to deal with them. I, want to, I don't want to deal with the out of controllableness of my life. I don't want to talk about how I can't fix something or how I can't solve something. You know what, we're, we're highly educated. We've got uh, the internet at our disposal. We've got resources around us. We've got doctors, we've got medicine, we've got 
therapists, we've got mentors and coaches, but you know what? Sometimes those just don't work. And where do I go when I can't solve life's problems? When I'm not smart enough or I'm not strong enough or I'm not fast enough to resolve something? And I'm here to tell you that there's somebody who can. His name is Jesus. And he can solve and heal and deliver, I promise you, your deepest hurt and your deepest pain and the greatest confusion and uncontrollableness of your life. He can fix it. Jesus gave this invitation. Come to me, all you that are heavy, all of you that are burdened, and you'll find rest in me. An invitation welcomes you to come. He doesn't ask you to get right. He doesn't ask you to change. He doesn't ask you to do different before you come. He said, in our broken state of heaviness and loneliness and emptiness, come to him and trust that he could turn your life around. I wouldn't be telling you that if I wasn't a living witness of how my life has been turned around from the emptiness and, and the loneliness and the despair to satisfaction, contentment, and real joy and peace. So if you're at that place of emptiness and aloneness and can't resolve life's problems, I just want you to come to Jesus now and invite him into your heart and say, now I'm willing to trust you. I'm willing to let you lead my life. I'm willing to get my hands off of my problems and trust you to be my savior and the solver of my problems. Just say, Jesus, I need a savior to save me from my sins. I don't know how to save myself from my sins. I don't know how to stop being out of control or doing what I'm doing. But I ask you, from the bottom of my heart, as I'm drowning in hopelessness and despair, save my soul. Jesus be my Lord. Amen. It's the greatest decision you've ever made. Thanks for watching. Hey guys, we want to build a relationship with you. If you have any questions or simply just want to reach out, let us know how you feel. Please message us or you can visit our Facebook page, leave a comment, or even send a video if you like. However you want to share your life, it's cool. Just be sure to do one simple thing. Come as you are. Hey, thank you for watching. If you're ever in the SoCal, Southern California, LA area, we want to invite you to physically come and be with us. We have a great viewing audience. We have a live streaming audience. We have a Facebook audience. But I'd love to be able to shake your hand, be introduced. So if you're ever in the area, come to one of our many services. But most of all, come up to me because we get really encouraged when we meet our television audience.